For more than 5,000 years, gold has inspired heroic quests, spurred fevered expeditions, and triggered mass migrations. Few objects have such power to move humans physically and emotionally. You look at the gold rushes and you look at the Spanish in South America, all focused around gold and people's desire for it. But what journeys does gold itself take? The gold that has been produced since day one, 85% of that gold is still being used today. In what unexpected places do people find it? And to what extremes will they go to get it? What strange and beautiful transformations does gold undergo in its lifetime? And what routes does it follow as it travels from the center of the earth to high fashion and on into deepest outer space? These questions can only be answered by journeying around the globe in search of the secrets of gold. The journey begins here in South Africa for almost 40% of the world's gold. From the mine tailings or man-made mountains that rise above the plains, to the numerous place names that reflect the precious metal's role, the land and history are rich with gold. But extracting this bounty comes at a steep price. Copenhagen Mine never sleeps. For workers in the morning shift, the sun has barely risen before they make their way to the mine. They are greeted by steel barriers and barbed wire. And just as the day begins, they plunge into darkness once again. They leave the warmth and sunshine behind and drop beneath the surface into a world all its own. In the mine, workers speak their own unique language. Called Fanagallo, it has 2,000 words, 500 of them curses and swears. It's a fitting dialect for this rough and dangerous place. 4,000 people a day drop two miles to the bottom on a ride that takes over 10 minutes. And it's just the beginning. With over 250 miles of shafts, Copenhagen is a small city tunneled from solid rock. It contains machine shops, infirmaries, and even its own railroad. South Africa's gold mines contain more miles of train track than all of the country's above ground railroads. Around the clock, trains shuttle miners to work sites as far away as three and a half miles. Assistant manager Frick Foray spends most of his waking hours in the mine. From the shop to the working place is a distance of two kilometers that you need to travel to get there. There are some of the working places currently that is running six kilometers away from the shop barrel that we are exploring and open up new ground currently. On the side wall itself, get a solid rock there, and then on the solid rock there's basically uh, like a mesh, steel mesh with lacing that we, we put on it. Now, it protects the small rocks from coming off, but it also the layers is not coming loose by having the mesh there to open the tunnel and keep the tunnel open. Cave-ins and explosions kill scores of South African miners every year. 
But the greatest everyday hazard comes from soaring temperatures. The rock down here radiates heat stored from when the Earth's crust formed. And temperatures can reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Huge pipes carry cooled air and water from the surface. And massive doors help control the airflow. 30% of the company's operating expenses go to ventilation and cooling. Working shafts are carved out just wide enough to allow miners to get at the ore. This saves time and labor, but creates some tunnels as narrow as three feet, barely enough to squeeze through. What you basically see here yeah, is the reef band. That is what we're looking for. You can see the color in the, in the, in the rock over here. This is a very grayish type of rock. Well, at the top is also what we call hanging wall and foot wall, and this grayish portion over here. So just to take out a piece, that's what we, we will find the gold in this portion over here. What we do is, is uh, with these drill machine operators that we've got here, we're drilling basically six one meter long holes that we then charge up with explosives and, uh, and we blast it to get one cubic meter of rock. And out of that cubic meter of rock, we'll get basically about 14 grams of gold. As tiny specks mixed in with other minerals, the gold is invisible to the naked eye. Yet this is some of the richest ore on Earth. Okay, it looks good, guys. I want you to draw for me right on the mark there, as we said on the mark itself, and then... Uh, to drilling properly online, eh? Yeah. All right. Okay. Water pumped from the surface cools and lubricates the drill bit, but little can dampen its roar. Hearing loss is common among miners. of plastic explosives are packed into each hole. And then the miners retreat to a safe distance. Miners pull 2.3 million tons of ore out of Copenhagen each year. It takes nearly five tons of ore to produce just one ounce of gold. Pulverizing and grinding the ore, giant tumblers turn solid rock into a fine powder. The addition of water transforms it yet again, this time into a gray slurry. What looks like a muddy river is in fact a rich stream laden with gold. To finally extract the precious metal, engineers add a poison, cyanide, which creates a pulp or sludge. This watery sludge is baked off and the end product is about 80% gold. Poured into rough molds, it forms what are called dory bars. Only then does the metal's beauty begin to emerge. But it has one more journey to make before it becomes pure. Coming up, 
Raw gold is made pure and then transformed into treasures fit for a king. When Secrets of Gold continues. Johannesburg, South Africa. Fueled by gold, no city has ever grown faster. Founded in 1886, its canvas tents gave way to brick buildings and in turn were replaced by steel and glass skyscrapers. Gold transformed Johannesburg from a farming town into a major city. And Johannesburg, Johannesburg, bars into pure gold. The precious metal arrives by helicopter at the Rand refinery. Under tight security, workers unload the dory bars. Here, the bars enter the final stages of the refining process. Almost one-third of the world's gold passes through the Rand refinery. We're doing about 400 tons a year, just over two tons a day. Uh, of gold that we are re refining every day. So that's about at least $20 million worth of gold that we do every single day. Furnaces heat the gold to almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, melting the metal and burning off impurities. Chlorine gas is infused into the liquid gold. It creates toxic vapors, but also binds to the remaining impurities, which then rise to the top of the molten soup. It's through this difficult, dangerous process that one of the world's most beautiful products is created. pour the gold like liquid fire into crucibles, which weigh over 40 pounds when filled. The gold almost seems alive, pulsing and glowing as if the fire has awakened its soul. A finishing flame ensures a bright, even surface. As it cools, it retains a warm, honeyed appearance. Unlike almost any other metal, gold seems to possess magical properties. Even those who spend all day processing and treating it as a product appreciate that there's something unique about gold. Well, look, I've been in the gold business all my career, so I've just learned to love our wonderful and unique product with its wonderful properties and its warm feel. It's got value, it's got uses, it's got beauty. 36 hours after it emerges from the ground, gold is converted into its purest form. Called four nines gold, it is now 99.99% pure. Within another 48 hours, the gold will set out again this time on a journey that leads to every corner of the world. Most of the gold goes on for making an array of products. We are in a, in a global business and selling into the global market. I think it's very exciting. European jewelers buy wire and beads. Investors from India and the Americas buy coins such as the Krugerrand. The Rand refinery feeds a hunger for gold that is almost as ancient as civilization. From almost the dawn of history, gold has traveled the planet, used as a common currency. In the early 20th century, virtually all of South Africa's gold was shipped 6,000 miles to London, England. Until 1968, nearly 80% of all newly mined gold in the world passed through these streets.
the precious metal formed the cornerstone of English commerce, and London became a hub in the gold trade. Today, London markets still set the world price for gold. Traders buy and sell the metal in huge lots valued in the millions of dollars. But far from the din of the city, tucked among the amber hillsides near Reading, England, one company specializes in gold on the microscopic level. At the Johnson Mathey Company, modern technicians do the work of ancient alchemists, transforming small amounts of gold into spectacular products. They use modern tools and technology to improve on a 1,600-year-old glassmaking technique. Now as then, the key ingredient is gold. What we have here are two glass pieces that were poured at 1,450 degrees centigrade. The glass at this temperature was molten and was poured out onto a cold slab to quench the glass or freeze the glass in, into this bar. One of the pieces is transparent and the other piece has a lovely ruby red colour. The only way that this colour can be produced is by adding small amounts of gold to the glass. And it's a property of very small particles of gold that give this bright striking red colour. Johnson Mathey also specializes in decorating high-end tableware, applying gold to ceramics and porcelain. Some of their wares grace the manors and castles of Britain's high society. But not all gold products are reserved for the upper class. Gold not only becomes what you eat off of, but what you eat with. In fact, much of what we take for granted in the modern world, from DVDs, to video games and text messaging, all depend on gold components. Without gold, our quality of life will be very, very different today. There would be no cell phones, there would be no computers, there would be no electronic games, there would be no electronic devices, uh, aircraft wouldn't fly because they all contain electronic circuitry. Uh, a lot of kitchen equipment, your bread maker, your oven, your microwave, all depend on gold and in the electronic circuitry. So the world today will be very, very different and poorer without the use of gold. Johnson Mathey coats an array of industrial products with gold because the metal never rusts. It's one of the best electrical conductors and it reflects heat and light. In their pursuit of perfection, Technicians use electron microscopes to inspect products down to the billionth of an inch. In spite of all its hard, cold properties, gold tugs on men's heartstrings. The whole history of gold is about emotion and relationships with gold. And you look at the gold rushes and you look at the Spanish in South America, all focused around gold and, and, and people's desire for it. Next, Secrets of Gold travels from the Andes Mountains of Peru to the royal palaces of Spain. In the Andes of South America, the Inca held sway over one of the greatest empires in history. While they ruled with an iron fist, they esteemed gold above all other metals. At the Inti Rami festival in Cusco, Peru, descendants of the Inca recreate their ancestors' winter solstice celebrations. Worshipping the sun, the Inca believed gold ran in their gods' veins. Was central to their worship, ceremonies, and other practices. The Inca had gold on their brains, literally. In a practice called trepanning, some Inca nobles drilled holes in their skulls, then covered them with gold. It was thought to have healing properties and to bring them closer to their sun god.
creating golden idols and festooning their temples with the precious metal. The Inca unintentionally brought about their own downfall. Spaniards came in search of gold. There are legends of lost cities where everything is gold. These are known as the Paititi, Pantlealcolia, or El Dorado. But they're just part of a fantasy the Spaniards dreamed up in their search for gold. The Spanish and Inca valued the gold for very different reasons. There are two distinct concepts about gold. The Spanish were looking for the metal because in their economic system, precious metals were important. The Inca knew of the gold just like other pre-Incan societies. But the gold didn't have the value of money nor of wealth. But they did prize it because they could use it to create objects for the occult and for social status. But gold didn't have any market worth because there was no selling or buying. So, the gold was used for political and religious purposes. The Spanish stripped the gold, melted it down, and shipped it back to Spain. Inca gold traveled across the ocean to Madrid. Much of it ended up in the El Escorial, the palace of King Philip II. Here, whole rooms were layered in the metal. The gold from Inca idols was transformed into statues of Christian saints and Bible scenes. But not all the Inca gold reached Spain. Pirates and shipwrecks took a heavy toll on the Spanish treasure fleets. Off of Key West, Florida, treasure hunters are trying to bring to light Inca gold that took an unexpected detour. It sank to the bottom of the ocean with a string of Spanish galleons. One ship, the Atocha, was ravaged by two hurricanes in 1622 and left a seven mile long treasure trail in its wake. The ship's holds contained everything from boxes of priceless emeralds to stones used as ballast. These are some of the most successful treasure seekers of all time, part of the Fisher team. On the bottom, they scan for anything metallic. Whatever the Atocha once carried that hasn't rotted away lies hidden beneath the sand and shells. What started out as a hobby for many has become full-time work. They are living out childhood dreams of finding buried treasure. And that dream has proven extremely lucrative. I'm very lucky I get to do what I like to do. I dream about finding buried treasure, and that's what I do for a living. I go out and find buried treasure. So, you know, I realize that I'm very lucky in that aspect. So far, we've brought up over $500 million worth of treasure from the Atocha. Maybe a little more from other wrecks. Altogether, Fisher-led expeditions have raised almost $1 billion worth of Spanish treasure from the ocean bottom. Much of it originally plundered from the Inca. Most of the gold came from Peru. This is one of the gold bars. Now this, again, was just money. Uh, they would use it for currency. At that time, the king didn't allow them to mint gold coins. So that's why there were so many gold bars and gold money chains on board, because they weren't allowed to make it into coins. But each bar is marked with the purity in Roman numerals. This one's 21, and then each dot's one quarter, so it's 21 and a quarter carats. And then up here is the owner's mark. Uh, it's Panavanda was the man's name, the Spaniard 
that owned this school bar back in 1622. So it's got a story to tell. Each bar has a story to tell. And each has taken its own journey. From the ocean bottom, a few select pieces now fill a museum in Key West. It's a striking showplace for the gold as well as a fitting display of the Fisher's success. A success that didn't come overnight. It took more than 40 years and unyielding conviction from the Fishers to sift through the historical records, raise the required funds, and overcome the frustrations of earlier dead ends before they struck it rich at the Atocha. Altogether, right now, we're working about a dozen shipwrecks. Uh, there are literally thousands of shipwrecks out there, and a good percentage of them are loaded with gold. There's probably more gold sitting out on the bottom of the ocean than there is on land. I could do it all my life and never even put a dent in it. And uh, I plan to bring up as much as I can before I die. There's a lot more out there. The Spanish used gold to build an empire. Today, it helps to ensure the stability of a grand republic. Coming up next, we journey from West Point to high fashion and into outer space when Secrets of Gold returns. Come, tune from the right. Come, half left. Forward. High on the bluffs above New York State's Hudson River, the United States Military Academy at West Point has long been a bastion of American security. West Point's storied past has been shaped by men and women who lived by ideals such as integrity. The campus itself conveys a sense of permanence and security. But West Point is about change. Here, raw recruits become officers. Instructors mold character, shape leaders, and turn civilians into military brass. And just yards away, another transformation central to American security takes place. Fences at the West Point Mint guard one of America's greatest secrets. Here, raw bars of gold are made into coins. The West Point Mint holds part of the nation's trove of gold, a stash second only to Fort Knox. This one vault alone contains about one-fifth of all the gold at West Point. Henrietta Holtzman IV serves as the 37th director of the United States Mint. Here at the United States Mint at West Point, we hold about 20% of the nation's gold reserves, about $20 billion. These are pure gold bullion bars. This is worth about $150,000. It weighs about 27 pounds, and we get about 400 ounces of gold out of these bars. And these two uh, pallets of gold, each one has about, um, about $14 million worth on each pallet. And behind me is about another $450 million worth of gold. The Mint doesn't just store gold. It also turns it into coins that it sells to investors and collectors. We have a working stock and we have a reserve stock. The working stock we make into gold bullion coins that are sold to investors and collectors worldwide. And the reserve stock we keep safely. Just as the government likes to keep its own stockpile of gold, smaller investors view it as a safe haven as well. Well, gold has often been seen as a substitute for money. It's a commodity that you can exchange. One fascinating aspect is that in times of crises, the world turns to gold as an investment. They did it after September 11th. They also did it at the turn of the century for the year 2000. 
now in the United States we use credit cards and we use paper currency very frequently. We do not use our gold, but it is here safely waiting in case America needs it. Collectors tend to be demanding about the quality of coins they buy, so the Mint has to prepare the gold carefully before making the final product. After the gold has been cut into the right shape, workers dunk the blanks into a vat filled with soapy water and tiny stainless steel balls. The spin and rinse buffs the blanks to a fine sheen. Next comes a series of fresh water and acid baths that clean off the last of the impurities. To keep the surfaces unblemished, no ungloved hand will touch them from now until they reach a collector. In the pressing room, dyes stamp with 360 tons of pressure, transforming gold slugs into legal tender. With a simple seal from the United States, the coin becomes a piece of rare beauty more valuable than the gold it contains. Collectors will pay a premium, sometimes a huge premium, for rare coins like these. To give us perspective about coins and their value, a coin similar to this coin was sold for $7.59 million, and it is the most valuable coin in the world. This pallet of gold in front of you is $14 million. So this coin is worth about half of this entire pallet. Henrietta Holzman Ford shares collectors' fascination with the metal. It is just always exciting to work around gold. It's just beautiful. It glows, it has a presence of its own, and it is an honor to be able to safeguard it for the nation. Just down the Hudson River from West Point, the nation's fashion and financial capital, New York. Sheathed in steel and concrete, the city has a heart of gold. Yeah, I think that might look really nice. And this collar, that's really beautiful. Yeah, the Orlandini should stay on that. At a World Gold Council photo shoot, many top jewelry designers put their wares on display. The cold metal sensual side begins to simmer under the hot lights. It takes a lot of hard work to create the impression of glamour. Again, you came up a ten, come up another ten for me, please. While models' days are long and demanding, gold goes through a far more arduous ordeal. To create their work, jewelers pound, stretch, bend and knit the metal. Soft and malleable, never corroding and never needing to be polished, gold makes an ideal medium for artists. Radiant and dazzling, gold also gives owners an excellent opportunity to express themselves. That's nice. Bingo. All right. Okay. Okay, now, on this, with this shot, what I really want is ultimate, like, oh my God, what an incredible gift I've just been given. I'm in love with this man. I'm smoldering. I'm going to burst. Okay, sweetheart, you ready? Because of its unique properties, gold plays a central role in many industries, from fashion shoots to space shots. In the heart of rural Pennsylvania, Newtown embodies the bedrock American values of community and family. It's also where America reaches for the stars. Lockheed Martin manufactures satellites in a state-of-the-art facility. The same luster and durability that have made gold valuable since ancient times is prized in the space age. Gold is very expensive and heavy, but ironically, it helps us get components like these light and cost-effective enough to get them up into space. Gold can be stretched to the width of just one-seventh of a human hair while still conducting electricity and heat. 
As a thin coating over lighter materials, it stops corrosion without adding much weight. Its unique properties allow gold to boldly go where no precious metal has gone before. And space is one of the most hostile places anyone or thing can go. This is our environmental test facility where we'll simulate the space conditions that the components are going to see and do the testing on them. We utilize bell jars to do that simulation. Now, when these satellites are in space, they are seeing some extreme conditions. They are seeing temperatures from minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit under a vacuum. So this is another reason why it's very important that we're utilizing gold components. Engineers test and retest components, going over them in minute detail. One fault or short in a single part could destroy a $500 million satellite. From Newtown, Lockheed Martin ships the components to a launch site where they are packed into a rocket's payload. Rockets themselves contain many gold components. As much as 40 pounds of the precious metal in the form of wires, connectors, and electronics ride into space with each launch. Reflecting the sun, dispersing heat, and conducting electricity, gold on satellites helps to keep our banks, GPS systems, and televisions working. Over 1,000 pounds of gold orbits the Earth. Some on board probes and exploratory craft even ventures out into deep space. Coming up, when Secrets of Gold continues, we travel to California's Silicon Valley, where gold is reborn and its journey begins again. Before outer space, the American West was the great frontier. And California beckoned to dreamers looking for the land of plenty. A trickle of pioneers became a flood as gold rush gave way to agricultural boom times. Fleeing the Dust Bowl, hundreds of thousands from the Midwest and Plains flocked to California. They worked the fields and helped the residents of Gilroy corner the market in one unusual crop. Garlic. But one Gilroy company rakes in a different type of crop. Computer chips. Famous for its high-tech companies and innovation, Gilroy lies at the southernmost tip of Silicon Valley. But one of California's growth industries isn't assembling computers. It's taking them apart. At Metech, yesterday's cutting-edge machines end up on the scrap pile. But this isn't the end of their useful life. Your PDA becomes obsolete, your cell phone becomes obsolete. What do you do with it? You throw it in a dump. It's gone forever, and not only that, the other products that are with it are going to cause pollution problems. So you're recycling. We recycle newspapers, bottles, and cans. Why not computers? Hard drives and RAM chips that once held prized bits and bytes are now being mined for more than data. Workers extract motherboards and other parts to get at a computer's tangible assets. In just minutes, they reduce a PC to little more than a heap of parts. Each one contains small amounts of gold, silver, and other precious metals. To get one ounce of gold, you probably need somewhere between 200 and 300 computers. So you just, you want 10 ounces of gold, 10 times that, and on it goes. And it can go on forever in a country where half the population owns a computer many becoming obsolete just months after purchase. There are roughly
roughly three ounces of gold in each ton of computer parts. This means that computers contain a higher concentration of gold than even the richest ore pulled out of any mine in the world. Let's take a look at a circuit board like this. This is a newer circuit board. This circuit board is a wealth of material. The most obvious gold is right along these tabs, they call them, or fingers. Each one of these integrated circuits, they contain gold. I took this thing off. This is a microprocessor. This is the heart of the machine. It has gold tabs along here. These contain gold. Take a look at these little switches. They contain gold. Under here is gold. And you know what you have here when you finish? You have a virtual precious metal mine. Just like gold ore from a mine, the computer components have to be prepped to maximize yield. A series of shredders and grinders reduce the parts to uniform sized pieces. Each motherboard contains about $1.25 in precious metals and costs almost 80 cents to process, making this an economically viable way to extract gold. It's much less expensive to recover precious metal from existing product like this than it is to mine. The energy involved in recovering an ounce of gold from a circuit board is probably 20 times less than the energy involved in getting an ounce of gold out of the ground and into the consumer's hand. Making the pieces consumes the most energy. It burns off the plastics and other impurities, the equivalent to the beginning stages of the refining process for raw gold. The metals are loaded into a furnace and heated to over 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Once again, a stream of liquid metal emerges from the fire. Chemically, the gold contained in these bars is the same as that mined in South Africa. Its time as a computer chip was only part of an odyssey that can lead anywhere. We run it through the circuit and the precious metal goes back in to be reused. Reused in jewelry, reused in coinage, reused in electronics. Gold rarely stays for long in one place, not even at London and Manhattan's most desirable addresses. The gold in our jewelry and computers may have been mined centuries ago and traveled thousands of miles before reaching us. So it's a complete circuit, it's a loop. It's neat. The gold that has been produced since day one, 85% of that gold is still being used today. Never rusting, never tarnishing, and ever precious. Gold is destined to never rest, but to travel from one use and place to the next. Who knows where its travels will lead? Gold's journey never ends.